In the previous video, we talked about how the White Huns arrived in the region of Bactria and Sogdia, and took over the areas from the remnant of the Kushans and the Kongju states, and their warfare and engagement with their neighbor, the Sassanid Persians, whom they defeated and even forced them to pay yearly tribute until the beginning of the reign of Kushro I. In the previous episode, we also saw that the White Huns were previously ruled by the Kitarite dynasty, but were later defeated and replaced by the Hephthalite dynasty. In this episode, we will talk about the expansion of the White Huns from Bactria and Sogdian regions, further to the south and the east. So the White Huns had started their expansion southward around 450s AD, and they had invaded India repeatedly during the reign of the Gupta monarch Skandagupta. These White Huns were basically repeating the roots of the political expansion of the Greco-Bactrian and Kushan rulers. And this expansion was being undertaken while the White Huns were still under the rule of the Kitarite dynasty. Indian sources tell us of these Hunnic people, whom they called the Huna, and tell us of the struggles of the Huna with the Gupta dynasty ruler, who controlled most of the Indian subcontinent at that time. The earliest Indian report on the Huna is in the Batari inscription of the Gupta ruler Skandagupta, where the king is said to have been in intense conflict with the Huna. While the exact date of the first clash of the Huna and the Gupta Empire is debatable, however, we can be sure that it occurred between 455 and 460 AD. Harmata suggests that Skandagupta won a victory over the Huna, and in accordance with the historical situation, these must have been the Kitarites. And this victory was probably because the Kitarites at this point were struggling on many fronts. The Hephthalite dynasty was on the rise against the Kitarites to take control of the whole of the White Huns, and again they were engaging with the Sasanians to their southwest. And so they were strained in their resources, and hence lost this fight against the Gupta Empire. However, they retained their control over Punjab and the western part of India, even after this defeat. But before moving forward we must address a thing that is a topic of discussion among the scholars, and that is that it is not exactly clear what kind of relationship existed between the Hunnic principalities in Transoxiana and those in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Indian region. The coins minted in these two regions have differences. Many historians and scholars think that these two groups of Huns were probably separate and independent of each other. Another question that needs to be put to light is, who were these Huna? The Alkans or the Hephthalites and the Kitarites? The scholars and historians are divided into two groups in this, one inclined towards believing that they were the Hephthalites, while in others' opinion these people were Alkans, and the proper Hephthalites never penetrated beyond the Hindukush. So without wasting much time on these debatable topics, let's get back to the history that we know about. So one of the first Hunnic rulers who conquered Gandhara and came close to Kashmir, was Tigin or Thujina, who may have been Kinjila. This conquest of Gandhara by the Huna is dated to around 465 AD. Now King Kinjila was not the Hun of the Kitarite dynasty, that invaded in the 450s AD and fought the Gupta ruler Skandagupta. He was rather a king of another dynasty named Alkan dynasty. He is also considered as the founding king of this dynasty. These new dynastic Huns were first mentioned as being located in Paropamasis, and later expanded southeast into Punjab and central India, as far as Aran and Kazambi. The Alkan invasion of the Indian subcontinent eradicated the Kitarite Huns who had preceded them, and contributed to the fall of the Gupta Empire, and in a sense, bringing an end to classical India. At the end of the 5th century AD, the Alkans were led by King Toramana. In Rajaturanjini, his name was Vasukula, he also had the title which meant Falcon. There is information in one of India's inscriptions about him, which reads, Famous Toramana, great luster of great glory, governor of land. Toramana ruled in parts of present-day Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab, and Kashmir. His expansion to the west was stopped by the Alikaras around Mansur. This is documented by the Ristal stone slab inscription of Prakashadharma Alikara. After the death of Toramana, his son Miharakula is supposed to have become the next king. Xuanzang wrote that Mohilo Kulo, Miharakula, who was talented and naturally brave, 
ruled throughout India, and all neighboring states were his vassals. Indian sources indicate that Miharakula had ferocity and fearlessness, especially Kalhana, in his historical chronicle of Kashmir Rajaturangani, gave a description of the king as violent, and like the god of destruction Kala, and many people feared him. Miharakula managed to extend his authority beyond northwestern India, to the Jamuganji's plain to Gwalior, and built a city, calling it Mahirapura. In his time, the Huns reached their highest power in India. In AD 532 or 533, he was defeated and captured by the ruler of Mundasur Yashodharman, from the dynasty Alikars, who controlled central India, but later he was freed by Baladitya, governor of Magadha. Baladitya, king of Magadha, who was Buddhist, then rebelled against Miharakula's order to persecute Buddhism in his empire according to Xuanzang. Miharakula invaded Magadha, but he was defeated and imprisoned by Baladitya. Later, Miharakula was released after a petition by Baladitya's mother. Because his younger brother became king in his kingdom, Miharakula took refuge in Kashmir, where he murdered the ruler and became king himself. Then he defeated the Gandhara kingdom, but less than a year after victory, he died. After the death of Miharakula, his heirs did not have his abilities and great strength, and thus their political power in India weakened. According to the scholars, the last independent ruler was Yudhishthira, who inherited the throne from Narendradija Kinkila, whose long rule in Kashmir was suspended in AD 670 by Durlaba Vardhana, representative of the new Karkota dynasty. Sunderman thought that the end of the Alkan rule in Kashmir was in AD 625 or 626. Later the Alkans settled in the occupied lands, and gradually adopted the religion and language of the conquered population in northwestern India. This invasion of India by the Huna people in the middle of the 5th century AD led to the downfall of the great Gupta Empire, though the Gupta dynasty in Magadha retained its authority until the end of the 7th century AD. In the 7th century, the western Punjab according to Indian sources was called Huna Desha, meaning Hun country. As late as the 9th century AD, the Hindu ruler Devapala of the Pala dynasty, who had a principality in the eastern Punjab, defeated Huna in the north. The Indian poet Rajasekara of the 9th century praised the beauty of Huna women. Also in the 9th century, to the northwest of Malva, a principality Hanumandala was located, which was ruled by King Jajapa. On a copper plate inscription, a feudatory of Pratihara Mahendrapala is said to have killed Jajapa and other kings of the Huna race in AD 893. Even in the 11th century AD, we still find traces of Huna. Another stone inscription, for example, reports that the Kalacha ruler Karnadeva married the Huna princess of Aladevi. The memory of the Hunas was alive in India even later, as the 16th century Jain writer Brahmana equated the Portuguese with the Huna. The Hephthalite state extended its authority further to the eastern Turkestan, where they were known as Kun. After AD 462, the arrival of the ambassador stopped from Kashgar to the Northern Way Empire, and after 467 from Khotan, and these facts have been linked to the conquest of the region by the Hephthalites. The region of Turfan was subjugated by the Hephthalites in AD 479 and Urumqi in AD 490-497. to In AD 495, the southern part of Teliots submitted to them, and in 496 AD, the northern Teliots suffered the same fate too, and their lands were annexed by the Hephthalite state. Thus, at the beginning of the 6th century AD, most of eastern Turkestan was in the hands of the Hephthalites. The Beishi states that, from Yeda owner in the western province depend Kangui, Khotan, Shale, Ansi, and 30 other small holdings. The Hephthalites' neighbors in the region were the Rurins. The Hephthalite defeated the Teliots in union with them. The Rurins were a mixture of Sanbi and Hunnic birth after their defeat by Tabgachi. They had originated from the Mongolian plains, where these people had been mixing with various tribes and multilingual people, and at the end of the 4th century AD, formed a separate ethnic group and established its Khaganate in AD 402, 
when their leader Shaluan took the title of Kagan. The Hephthalites had a good relationship with the Rurins. The Rurin Kagan Chonu signed an agreement with the Hephthalites directed against the Wei Empire, their common enemy. As could be expected, the Rurin Hephthalite unification led to a breakdown of relations between the Hephthalites and the Wei Empire. In AD 520, Kagan Chonu died, and Anakue became the new ruler of Kaganate. Some parts of the Rurins were discontent. Then Anakue was defeated, and he fled to the Wei court where he obtained help. Meanwhile, the vacant throne was occupied by Anakue's uncle Brahmin, known in Chinese transcription as Palomen. Anakue, with the Chinese help, could defeat Palomen, and succeeded in establishing himself in the area near Kokonor. In AD 521, Brahmin established links with the Hephthalites. Three of Brahmin's daughters, or sisters, simultaneously got married to the Hephthalite king. In spite of this, Wei troops later captured Brahmin and brought him to the empire, where he subsequently died in AD 524. Anakue remained the sole ruler of the Rurins. Given that the Hephthalites conquered much of Central Asia, Eastern Turkestan, and much land in the south towards India, it is clear that by the mid-6th century AD, the Hephthalites had created a huge empire. The first half of the 6th century can therefore be considered as the time when the Hephthalite Empire flourished. In the second half of the century, it suffered from the onset of Turkic Khaganate from the north, and in the south from Sasanian Iran. And as a result, this sequence of events directly led to the downfall of the Hephthalite Empire. A new state association that formed in the second half of the 6th century AD and played an important role in the history of Central Asia was the Turkic Khaganate. The Turks are known in the written sources by different, though similar names. The Turkic Khagan Bumin in AD 551 started war with the Rurins, who dominated over the Turks. The Turks finally defeated and destroyed the state of the Rurins and became one of the strongest political entities in Central Asia. In the future, the borders of this Turkic Khaganate would go on to stretch from Korea to the Black Sea. Now, part of the defeated Rurins fled to northern China in AD 554, and another part to the west, towards Eastern Europe, where they appeared in AD 558, and became known as the Avars, and set up a new state, the Avar Khaganate, in Pannonia, modern Hungary. The appearance of the Turks in the mid-6th century AD in Central Asia fundamentally changed the situation. As a result of their western campaign in AD 554, which was led by the younger brother of Bumin, who carried the title Yabgukaganistami, the Turks for one and a half years controlled the whole of central Kazakhstan, Semerechi, and Khorezm. In AD 555 they reached the Aral Sea and approached the border of the Hephthalite Empire. However, these new enemies did not start war immediately. Active military actions began only eight years later. The first military collision between the Turks and the Hephthalites, according to one scholar, was in AD 555. Turkic troops were led by Mukin Kagan, the son of Bumin Kagan. A second one occurred in AD 558 and was led by Istami. The political situation of the Hephthalite state significantly changed in the middle of the 6th century AD. Sasanian Iran under the governance of Khusro I, in the 30s of the 6th century, began to grow rapidly. The first result was the termination of paying tribute to the Hephthalites. But he was not ready to engage in open combat against the Hephthalites. Khusro I in AD 557 concluded a truce with Byzantium, which after five years changed into a peace agreement so he had calmed the western borders. Even before that in AD 554, the Sasanian Empire and the Turks entered into an offensive alliance against the Hephthalites, which was sealed by the marriage of Khusro and the daughter of Istami, who would later give birth to the later Shahinsha, Hormuzd IV. Thus the Hephthalite state was caught from two sides, on the north the Turkic Khaganate, and in the south the Sasanian Iran. In this context, we need to take into account the fact that in the south, another part of the Hunnic people, that is the Alkans, were still fighting the Indian principalities and could not provide any real assistance to their northern branch. The Hephthalites in this situation tried to renew their relations with China, but were unsuccessful. In AD 558, Yabgukagan Istami, 
attacked the Hephthalites from the north in alliance with Khusro I. The reason was given by the Hephthalites themselves. Trying to prevent the alliance between the Shahinsha and the Kagan, he killed the Turkic embassy moving through the Sogdia, except for one man who escaped and brought the message to the Kagan. War became inevitable. Mobilizing troops, the Turks invaded the Hephthalite state. First, they conquered Chach, Tashkent, then crossed the river Churchik and the Turkic troops stayed in Mamur. The king of the Hephthalites had already begun to gather troops. In the region of Bokhara, the troops from Balk, Shugnam, Bashgird, Termez, Amul, Zem, and other areas of the state concentrated. The Hephthalite king decided not to take the battle on the plain, where the cavalry of the Turks had more advantages. He retreated to the mountains and fought at Nesef. The battle lasted for eight days and ended with victory for the Turks. The date of this event is not clear, and researchers place this date differently, but all of them placed it between 557 and 567 AD. After this defeat, the remainder of the Hephthalites moved south, where they chose as the successor of the previous king after fallen in battle, the Shaganian ruler Faganish, a Hephthalite by origin, who hurried to comply with the Sasanians in order to avoid full defeat from the Turks. Khusro I had attacked simultaneously with the Turks against the Hephthalites and occupied some of the areas south of Amudaria. The Sasanian Shahinsha had been waiting for the Turks and the Hephthalites to weaken each other in the war and joined later according to Soloviov. In his view, this explains why the Hephthalites gathered troops in Tokaristan, since from the south no one threatened. It was only after the victory of the Turks that Khusro I moved, trying to get his share of the Hephthalite state. According to Ad-Dinawari, Khusro I had sent the troops to the country of the Hephthalites and conquered Tokaristan, Zabulistan, Kabulistan, and Shiganian. Then the Turkic ruler, Sinjibu Kagan, gathered his men and marched to the Khorashan. He occupied Chach, Fergana, Samarkand, Kesh, and Nesef and received Bokhara. Menander Protector mentions that when in AD 568, the Turkic ambassadors arrived in Constantinople, the Emperor Justin II asked them, You have subjected all the power of the Hephthalites. All, answered the ambassadors. Thus we know that in AD 568, the Hephthalite state was already broken up. The Hephthalites thus fought against two mighty enemies simultaneously for nearly ten years. Due to an agreement concluded in AD 566 between the Turks and the Persians, Khusro I received all former Hephthalite lands south of the Amudaria as well as the inheritance of the Hephthalite king, Faganish the Shiganian. The Turks received Sogdia, Shash, Fergana, and eastern Turkestan. Khusro I was actually unable to establish his authority in the territory of Arachosia and Zabulistan, so that the Hephthalite king continued to rule there, as well as in Badgiz and Herod. The dividing of the Hephthalite state did not bring complete peace between the recent allies. In the northern Tokarishtan, the remainder of the Hephthalite troops concentrated there and paid tribute to Khusro I. According to Artemanov, the Turks required from Iran, which was paid by the Hephthalites, as well as free journey through the territory of Iran, for merchants from Sogdia, which had become part of the Turkic Khaganate. Khusro I rejected these conditions, and the Turks moved to the Sasanian borders, but having encountered powerful fortifications on their way in Gurgan, did not dare to go further. Ambassadors were sent by the Kagan to Constantinople to convince the Byzantine Emperor Justin II to begin joint actions against Sasanians. Byzantium delayed an answer, but the Turks did not want to begin the war against the Persians on their own. But Kagan later having reconsidered, decided to have a good relationship with the Sasanians and offered the Shahinsha his daughter as wife. Thereby, as a result of negotiations, the border of political influence was fixed on the Amudaria, northern Tokaristan remaining a sort of buffer territory under the power of the Hephthalites, but paying tribute to the Turks. The southern part of Central Asia thus, probably for a certain time, continued to exist as a semi-independent Hephthalite possession. However, Khusro I having used some pretext occupied an area lying beyond the Balkh River, that is to say, Amudaria and reached Hutalan. The Hephthalite king was killed, 
and his holdings were integrated into the Sasanian Empire. And so this is how the White Huns came to an end. Although there remained some Hephthalitone regions which were mostly reduced to small domains, some completely independent, some giving tribute to either the Turks or the Persians. So this is it for today. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.